is Carlo Van Driesten from the BMW Group, where he's a system architect responsible for virtual testing and validation. And we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction. So my topic for today will be how can I enable virtual test and validation in such a complex system? We've heard before uh, from the colleague from Bosch that it is a little bit different uh, to build an autonomous driving car than a robot inside of a factory. And for this, I want you to look at the first small video clip. Imagine being a function developer who has to develop a function that follows a lane and has to keep the distance to a car and that felt close. So what was the problem in this situation? There was someone who designed the function and he actually came too close to the car up front. So we have a KPI that tells us the distance to the car cannot go under a certain threshold. So what the developer has to do, he has to write a test that if he pushes everything to the build system, that this small simulation, and this is just one scenario, is running and is testing for that specific KPI. And in the end, he has to do it over and over again. He's tweaking the function, he's adding a new test, he's doing the simulation, he's analyzing the results. And this not only to develop his function without having to go to the physical car and driving around the corner, but also to, to maintain the functionality with all the different developers that are already uh, developing on new functions and potentially breaking his. So if we look at the overall uh, chain of effect we see that all the components that you see here from the environment and the sensors and the perception and the actua actuators were replaced in this example and simplified. And what we have actually tested is the prediction of telling that someone is coming from the left and going in front of me and the driving strategy in terms of uh, I have to brake now and make the distance a little bit further. So. But if we don't want to cut away the perception and if we want to test the logic of our perception or maybe the performance, we need to replace the sensors itself by models. So let's take a look at the sensors in this case. We have uh, different kinds of sensors. Who are, uh, which are better in certain situations. We've heard the camera is bad if we have strong light, which is uh, blinding the camera. And uh, we may see different examples where some sensors outperform the others. So we have a collection of, in this case, 54 uh, environment perceiving sensors in the highway assistant at BMW, 54. So let's take a look at uh, what kind of data are these sensors producing? So if we have a test ride, which you can see in the top left, and a camera detecting the lanes, this is kind of one element that is detected. What you now see are these raw sensor detections. These are the, the points of the LiDAR or the stixels of the camera. And those are fused together to objects here in white of every single sensor. And then the multiple sensors are fusing these different parts to the red boxes. And now you have more confidence on the objects. What is missing is that you have to self-locate uh, the vehicle and objects around in a certain map. And in the end, you have to give it additional high-definition map data. So what if we want to replace all these sensors that we have in reality uh, with models. And we want to model all these imperfections that you have seen because the, those are the imperfections that the environment perceiving module is struggling with. So this journey basically starts with this man. So this is Edmund Husserl and he is the founder of the phenomenology. So, and the phenomenology is something that uh, I came across when I was uh, cleaning up my desk and I found a piece of paper. And um, 
the phenomenology is basically a reflective study of how things appear to our conscious awareness and ultimately how the world appears to us in terms of our subjective experience. Because actually the sensor is as our eyes just giving us an image of the world and how they in their subjective perception are able to see the world. As a dog can only see black and white, the lighter can only see dots. So we have to have a reflective study on how these effects occur from these sensors. And we have to take a deep look inside how they are functioning. So in the beginning, we may start at the bottom left with idealized models, you can call them, where you have a technical data sh sheet. For example, this radar can look 200 meters far. So if you have objects which are far, farther away than 200 meters, you just don't see them. It's a model, it's a simple one, but it's some to start with. And now uh, these phenomenological sensor models can somehow be described in that triangle where you move from left to right and you get more knowledge about the sensor. So maybe you add a physical equation that you know, for example, that the range dependency of radar uh, return power is relevant, or that the LiDAR intensity uh, is different on different materials. Or you have, for example, collected a lot of data, the data that you've seen before, and you realized, because of the labeling, that some objects were missing. So you have statistics about object misses, and you can make a stochastic model about that. So all of that gives us a further or a better model of these specific sensors, of these 54 specific sensors. So now let's see. So if we have the environment of, on the left and the simulation, we have in the middle these sensor models and they are somehow connected and connected in the end to our perception module. So the left side, you can call it the ground truth. The ground truth is objectivity. It's what is real. It's, I can say what it is, maybe you can, I don't think so, because we are all subjective, but we have to find a kind of a description of the world that is objective and that is fed into these models. And these models give the subjective view in terms of their sensor data. So these are the two interfaces that can be described for sensor modeling. And for this, we created the Open Simulation Interface, which is an open source GitHub project where we define these interfaces and you not only have the interface itself, you have a way on how to package these models with FMI, for example, and you have some tooling for validation. So why am I saying that? It's because we're talking about safety and I think safety is something that has to be, that you have to develop a sense for that. Developers need to have fun while doing <laughs> safety. They, need to want to do it. It's not that one guy who reads the 500 pages and who's the only one knowing it. It has to come natural to everyone. So basically, I think if we talk about standards and keeping standards and trying to integrate test methods, it has to come natural to a developer. So and that's why you should give a developer what he normally needs and uses, open source tooling, something to uh, which has a look and feel you can test and try out and further develop it and you can get involved quite easily. And you can see in the top you have statistics of the last few weeks where we have 240 unique people who looked at the repository. I dare to say that's about the number of people who uh, care about sensor modeling, so it's quite fine. And uh, the fun thing about statistics, there are actually two people who search with Bing. So I didn't know that actually someone is using that. And you can see that we have f a fairly big amount of members uh, that are actively contributing to this repository. And it's coming from the Pegasus project, for example, and from different companies around the world who are interested in modeling. So it's basically creating a platform for contribution for finding consensus, because that's what is difficult, finding consensus on something where we all have to integrate our parts. So 
let's look at this picture again. It's not only the sensor model, which is difficult. We have a lot of things that feeds into the sensor model, the ground truths, as I said. So the ground truths exist on, of the description of the world. So the world is described by the lines on the street, by the roughness of the material in its description, by the different plants that are around, the buildings, the models of the cars. So we basically need a common understanding of these modules to, for people to give data. I want a BMW car, I want a Mercedes car, and I want it in the same format so that I can integrate it in my simulation tool. So for that, we founded the OpenX at ASAM. ASAM is a standardization organization with 270 members in measurement in, in the automotive industry. And we transferred there the uh, formats of OpenCRG for surface roughness, OpenDrive for the description of road network, and OpenScenario in the initial draft for describing scenarios. You've seen Fortalix before with MSDL, that goes in that direction. It's a description of, for a language so that a test engineer can describe a scenario. And I'm very happy to announce today that we just last week signed the contracts that the open source project of the open simulation interface is now also coming to ASIM. So we transferred all the rights and gave that open source project and which remains open source into the hands of ASAM so that everybody can, uh, can participate not only through GitHub but also through the processes that are, uh, that are used by the different companies for standardization and to give it a proper governing body. So why are we doing the standardization? So I was, I was talking about a lot of different standards and the idea is I need a function test for my developer. And in order to achieve that, you can see a lot of tooling outside. And I want to do a best pick because some, some companies are better at different things. So in order to make that possible and make it, uh, uh, make it possible to integrate modules, I need standardization. I have to exchange maps. I may have a map of Munich. Maybe someone else has one of Berlin. If everybody has to measure every map, it's getting quite expensive. So modularity of the development framework is also very important because you want to do place a scenario generation tool with a good simulator that knows how to do hill testing, for example. And you want transparency because I think, as is open source, transparency is key for safety because the more people that look at it, the better it is. And in the end, it gets you cost and time reduction. So when all of this is done together, it was born out of the Pegasus family. We have follow-up projects for that. And it's uh, coming into the standardization body of ASAM. And ASAM is also in a liaison with an ISO group for scenario-based testing, for example. So all of that comes together. So now, let's take a look and make a recap of all that you've seen. In the end, you're using a simulation tool. The simulation tool can come from different vendors. I'm just putting some names there, okay? And they are missing a lot. So in the simulation tool, it has to load a map because even if you create scenarios, you need the underlying map for it. So where's it coming from? There are other companies, create maps. Well, let's take the format of OpenDrive and integrate these OpenDrive into the different simulators. And then we need sit city models, for example. We only have the, the lanes, but all buildings are missing. So let's take some city models. There are other companies providing these. And all of these models, they have a surface with a material. So what are the material properties for a camera? In a simulation tool, everything is done so it looks appealing for the human eye. It's completely irrelevant for the sensor a radar looks with 77 gigahertz. So the reflectivity of these uh, specific uh, elements is important. You have to measure them. So we have another few companies who know about, uh, for example, material data. And then you need scenario data. One you've seen before, there are more. And 
uh, you have maybe databases in your NCAP or someone else who can provide you with some, uh, with, with some scenarios, and all of them, they flow into the simulation. And what is the reason for it? The reason is that the radar model, for example, by Bosch, has to be developed inside the simulation tool. And after they have developed this kind of model, they're giving it to the OEM, maybe using another tool, I don't know. So what I'm trying to tell here is it's a very large ecosystem with a lot of players, and the complexity is not only because of the function that we're developing, but also because of the diversity of the ecosystem. And we're doing this not just for fun, but in the end, we're doing this with certification and standards because we want to prove it to somebody. I want to prove that this function is working, and that's important. So you kind of see the flow of the data and components who, in the end, flow into uh, a kind of certification process. Someone giving me a stamp that it's OK. And now the problem is not only the different companies, but also that everybody has their its own database. And everybody claims, well, I'm having the database. I'm meeting someone from Germany, says we have the database. Then I'm meeting someone from Japan, they have also the database. I didn't know that. So now I'm trying to think, do I have to choose the database? Or maybe I can interconnect them with each other. So what I'm seeing is an ecosystem. So I'm trying to build an ecosystem. So. I have the Automotive Simulation Center Stuttgart, and with them, we created a vision and an idea for a prototype This is currently under development, which interconnects different partners and builds kind of a settlement layer. And with settlement layer, I mean that can enable the transactions of different components that you have seen in this ecosystem flowing. And that can also give a proof of the transaction of these components, and you can have the traceability for that. Because there's always the fear that I'm giving you a model and you're just taking it and giving it to someone else. So I'm kind of protecting people that are giving data and models by having a traceability of the transactions on this layer. Let's call it like this. So I'm, I'm keeping it a little bit of mystery here. But let's look, at the, let's look at the challenges of this ecosystem. So I kind of need an immutable documentation of that so that I can have authorities believing me that I actually have the component, I used the component, I did the test, I also I stored the test results, I gave the test results to somebody. And I can reuse it. I need transparency because ba basically of the digital rights management, because of fear of stealing. And I need automated contract execution. So I'm giving you the compon component and everything is going automatically. So I have, to ch uh, I have a challenging problem of licensing, of the certification of all of that. And I need a convenient access management to get to all these different components and databases. And if I, if I just repeat a few things, immutable documentation, automated contract execution, transparency, it may ring a bell that this might be a use case actually for blockchain. So what, what is a blockchain? A blockchain is actually something that gives you trust, a trust of exchange of something. In this case, it may be money. In this case, I just want to use it for a very simple thing, of the possibility to trace results. I have a map, I'm building a hash of this map. I have to keep it and store it, and I'm placing the hash somewhere in a blockchain. I'm having a test result, and I'm building a Merkle tree of these different hashes, and in the end, I can have a proof of, in time, that these components and these specific components were used together and if then I have to show it to somebody, I can give them a USB stick and normally they say, well, I think you created this yesterday. And I can point to 
this Merkle tree and say, no, that was actually created a few weeks ago. So you have challenges of that ecosystem. And it, one of these challenges, for example, it has to be kind of open. Because I think uh, such, an, such a technology is something which is very cost uh, intensive. So I'm not building the internet only to watch YouTube. It has more than one application. So that's why I wouldn't use a private one. So I need privacy. And there are different ways to ensure privacy in transactions. And I need safety in usage. And I think formal verification is an interesting word to place here for the building of automated contracts. And I need the possibility for governance and upgradability. And there, are, there is a consortium here uh, at BMW, founded by BMW, with the technology that we're using for that prototype. So if you see, I'm, I'm trying to build up a story here. And the story is that, first of all, there are standards, there are documents. These standards, they have to live. You have to look and feel them, look at them, and you have to feel them. You have to use them. And you have to, for example, create your sensor model. You need these standards, and you need the data for these standards. So what if there is a map standard and nobody uses it? Everybody is using MP3 because there is an iTunes store. It's very convenient. And convenience and availability is very important for that. And we're talking about content standards in this case. And then I'm doing this because I have a very complex ecosystem. And the complexity of that ecosystem gives me the necessity to do something like this. And I have to give an incentive for the different players to work together and to give their best solutions. So actually, if you're interested in more detail about this and you want to see a proof of concept, I invite you to Aachen in November, where we intend to show something. And this would be my closing word, and I thank you for your attention. You, you talked about formal verification, which is something that I'm interested in, in, in generating contracts or in verifying whether contracts are being satisfied. So for example, if you, um, the, the technology I'm using is for example, uh, the protocol is developed in Objective Camel. An objective camel is a functional programming language, which makes it very easy to do formal proofs. So for example, you can make the proof of something that you actually know. So it's, it's not uh, the super weapon, but you can, for example, define that uh, no one is allowed to take the money out of my wallet if I'm not allowing it, or give you a specific signature. And you can just mm. validate it through the whole, whole protocol, and there is no need for this kind of Let's call it fuzzy testing that we're doing with simulation. And I think it's something that people have to look at because uh, I think I also heard that yesterday, that some, maybe you said it, that people are simulating things that they can also just mathematically prove. So I think sometimes you have to connect both words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Use them in a complementary way. Mm -hmm. Please. I think it was one of the highlights of today. It was a really good presentation. Um, when we talk about autonomous driving, all we hear is about LIDARs, radars, cameras. I think it's one of the first time I hear someone talking about HD maps and importance of the maps. Um, maybe a generic, generic question, but how do you evaluate the importance of HD maps in autonomous driving in general? So the first question to ask is, what is HD? So, uh, because for example, normally you take maps, I just give one example for navigation. And for navigation, you want to calculate a route. And you want to know if, for example, uh, on a specific route, there is a speed limit sign. So normally in the NDS standard, you have a speed limit sign assigned to a specific road. But if you do testing with a LiDAR model, you have to know exactly where this specific shield is in order to have a reference. So for a tester of a model or something like this, it's not HD enough. So it's put into context. So the question is, what do we want to achieve with these maps and for what are they used? 
I'm talking from the perspective of uh, someone who's do doing simulation and modeling, so I have uh, much higher requirements as someone who's doing navigation, for example. And I see it, this is one of the, the, the cost, biggest cost factors. If I have to measure the whole of Germany in a detail grade of one centimeter for, for every edge that I'm having, that's very costly. OK, uh, unless there are more questions, then let's thank the speaker.